deck building time, but before I get started, I want to talk about a few things. A number of decks I build on this channel will have some quirky additions that break from the norm. With that said, clearly people are going to have differing opinions on the quality of these decks, both in general and when compared against their contemporary counterparts. If you want to comment, do try to keep it civil and logical. If you don't like the deck, that's fine. Just have a reason beyond this deck sucks. Second, there will be times, heck, there will be a number of times when I mispronounce a card name. For those of you, for those of you who are bothered by this, I'm sorry, but just let it go. For me, the important thing is that everybody understands what card I'm actually referencing at the time. All right, with that out of the way, let's get on to the deck build. For the first deck build, we're going to tackle Noble Knights. Noble Knights is an interesting deck with all the tools to to succeed, but they really haven't lived up to that potential. One reason may be just the simple love-hate relationship it has with players, largely due to its kind of lockdown deck strategy that turns off a lot of people. But those feelings notwithstanding, let's begin. Starting off, the most important monster in the Noble Knight deck is Medrot, so not surprisingly I run three copies. Medrot is basically a much better, more archetype-specific version of Summoner Monk. The key element to Medrot's effect is the order of events. When it is equipped with a Noble Arms Equip spell, you can special summon a Noble Knight monster from the deck in defense mode, then send the one Noble Arms equipped to Medrot to the graveyard. Because almost all of the Noble Arms Equip spells have a single turn recursion effect where you can re-equip the removed Noble Arms to a Noble Knight on the field, the special summons of Medrot is basically free. In addition, due to the nature of the effect, you can re-equip the removed Noble Arms card to the newly summoned monster to activate its effect if so desired. Realistically, the chief strategy of running this deck is to get Medrot on the field with an equip as fast as possible in order to set up your future combo plays and set up your XZ plays. The second most important Noble Knight, and the monster that you will be getting with Medrot's effect 90 plus percent of the time, is Boar's. Boar's search effect is basically a mini painful choice. Hmm. So oh, this is a monster with an effect that gives you a free card through general emulation of an effect of a banned card. Definitely three copies. Through Boars, you get to thin your deck three bad top decks, for even in Noble Knights, equip spells are not good top decks. Add a free Noble Arms to your hand, and load Noble Arms ammunition for your XZ plays to the graveyard. Similar to Medrot, a chief goal of running Noble Knights is to activate Boars' effect as soon as possible to maximize the efficiency of your draws and the strength of your archetype-specific XZ monsters. Now, I've seen a few Noble Knight deck builds that only run two copies of Boars, which makes no sense to me. The only real explanation for this decision is the statement that well, you don't need three copies of Boars. This statement really doesn't have any logical basis for me. Boars is the second best monster in your deck, Yet, you should only run two, not three? The only logic that could explain this reasoning is if you wanted to run a 40-card deck and, due to a lack of space, you could only fit two copies of Boars. However, I can't fathom any deck build where there are not a number of other cards that should be removed before removing a third copy of Boars. You want Boars at three because its potential is maximized when it's either in your hand or your deck, but especially the deck. Three copies ensures a higher probability of having a board where you need it, versus two copies. So three copies of boards over two copies, always. The next Noble Knight I run, two copies of Gwaine. Incidentally, for the lore surrounding Gwaine, an actual legend, it would have been nice if this card had a much better effect, kind of almost a superstar effect, but its existing effect is useful enough. Gwen is actually a nice mid to late game card due to its special summon effect. The effectiveness of the Noble Knight specific XZ is contingent on Noble Arms equipped in the graveyard, so that does limit Gwen's usefulness early game. Overall, Gwen's usefulness as a generic XZ fuels up and down because of the general importance of Medrot and Boar's effects. You kind of always want to go into your archetype specific XZs first. Overall, though, Gwen is a useful card in most situations due to that special summoning effect especially, as, as mentioned, mid to late game. 
Well, what might be surprising to all the viewers here is that's all the Noble Knight monsters I run in this Noble Knights deck. This is all the Noble Knights I use because the rest, I just... The way I run my deck, it's just their effects don't lend themselves to the efficiency of that deck strategy. However, just because I only run these Noble Knights doesn't mean that they're the only good Noble Knight monsters. For example, Dryzden can be a useful card with the 1800 attack body. He produces an easily activated, basically free card destruction effect. I mean, the nice thing about Dryzden is his flexibility helps you destroy any face-up card, not just monsters. So the card can eliminate pendulum monsters, pendulum card, you know, supply squads, Yang Zing creations, Vandy's emptinesses, etc. However, for the reason I don't run Dryzden is I feel the card's too lone wolf for my taste. And the XZ monsters are just better lone wolf cards, so they're better monsters to run in comparison. You know, Ishtar is he's a very useful card, but I don't run enough other Noble Knight monsters to warrant using him because he's a pretty bad draw unless you use a special summon effect. For Noble Knight builds that run a larger number of Noble Knight monsters, you know, at least twelve or so, I mean Ishtar is a worth a look. Bedweer He's just outclassed by other cards. His graveyard dump effect is vastly inferior to Boar's, and its equip switch effect is of limited usefulness, largely due to the existence of Gwen. Overall, there are some very specific situations where its effect could be useful, but for the most part, there are just better cards that can be put in the deck. Kvalfa Chad, this card is just not good enough for my taste. If the graveyard target was special summoned, or you could summon special summon him, through some inherent effect, I think it would be much more useful, but if you want to make use of his effect right away, he's only going to have 1500 attack plus whatever attack augmentation the equip card has, and it can't produce much field advantage because you have to use that normal summon, so it has to survive a turn. And overall, if adding Noble Knights from the graveyard to your hand really appeals to you, running the Warrior Returning Alive is actually a superior to this card in my opinion. Some might argue this card can produce multiple turns of Noble Knight Edition, creating advantage, but the problem is that advantage typically is too slow that it really f hurts the general attack flow of the deck, which is a bigger negative. Brothers. I can see people making an argument for this card due, its, due to its myriad of effects. You know, it has 2400 defense, it has a draw effect, it has decent XZ potential, However, for my taste, the draw effect is more often a liability, especially for this deck build, over a benefit, because uh, Noble Knight decks, in my opinion, want its equipped cards either in your hand or your de graveyard, not in your deck. I mean, some can make the counterpoint that this draw, ef draw effect in combination with Boar's effect is a significant advantage producer. You draw one card by putting three equips into the deck, then you use Boar's Effect to select those three equips, adding one to your hand, returning two to the grave, so you get a net of one draw plus one equip spell. However, even though this point is correct, for me, the times at which Boar's and Brothers will be on the same field is somewhat limited. If you're making the maximum, if you're making your most efficient XZ plays, also, Medrock and Gwain's effects kind of squash the usefulness of the special summons effects for Brother. Now, if Noble Knight's got a new XZ that required three monsters instead of two, then I think Brother's special summon effect would be much more useful as an avenue of, to acquire to special summon this non-existent monster, but right now it's just kind of like almost a luxury card more than anything. Moving on to what other monsters I run... Three copies of Merlin is essential to maximize deck efficiency. While Merlin has three different effects, 90% of the time his first effect, which involves special summoning, will be the principally used effect. The XZ effect can be useful for baiting your opponent to using resources by waiting to XZ, although this effect will typically be only relevant late game versus early game, because there's little value in actually waiting before you XZ, you want to XZ off Medrot's effect as fast as possible because typically Medrot will summon a monster in defense position and you can't really get any benefit from that card being in defense position from a standpoint of being any type of wall or an attacker because most noble knights do have lower defenses. 
For the most part, though, Merlin is just another means of getting out Medrot, and since Medrot's so useful, Merlin by indirect association is also useful. While technically a monster, Gwen might as well be an equip spell, and there really is nothing bad about Gwen. Her graveyard recursion effect increases the effectiveness of both Medrot and Boars, especially late game. Her 300 attack point gain combined with light protection can help stall, as well as force the opponent to use more resources to remove your monsters than they may prefer. Her dark destruction effect is probably one of the most annoying effects in the game, turning the equipped monster into a battle destruction wrecking ball. However, because of the graveyard recursion effect, I only use one Gwen my main deck, but I do side another in case I face a deck with significant banish capacity, like zombie deck or somebody running you know, DD Crow. Now we're going to move on to probably the most controversial card in this deck. I've run three copies of Mystic Tomato. When re-examining Merlin, it is a dark monster and only has 1400 attack, which makes it a prime candidate for Mystic Tomato. I'm not sure when it happened, but for whatever reason, Battle Searchers really fell out of favor for a number of players, and I guess it I guess it came from a form of groupthink, almost, with regards to speed, when someone just determined one day that, well, these battle searchers, they're just not fast enough anymore. I mean, my gosh, they have to be destroyed as a result of battle? Oh, that's just so slow. Last time I checked, 80 plus percent of the time when a monster is removed from the field, it's removed via battle, especially when monsters are face down. In this build, Mystic Tomato produces field control, deck thinning, and gives you another way of summoning Medrot through the summons of Merlin. The one important note, though, is due to Merlin's summoning restriction, you can't summon Merlin through Tomato by ramming Tomato into Merlin during your turn and then summoning Medrot through Merlin. So, typically you have to wait for your opponent to wipe him out, but again, I'm not so down on Battle Searchers as it seems like everyone, a bunch of other people. Also, with the addition of Tomato, I now have three more dark monsters that increase the probability of black luster summons. I think Merlin's kind of unreliable because you, know, you only have three darks and you might be removing him from play once in a while just in case you want to use his nice XZ secondary effect. So, with that said, I'm putting one copy of black luster. The secondary advantage to maximizing the summoning potential of black luster is that black luster is a warrior, so you can equip it with Noble Arms Destiny making it even more difficult to remove from the field. Moving on to the spells and traps, with Noble Knights being warriors, three copies of reinforcement of the army is clearly mandatory. For the Noble Arms, I run three Destiny because of its anti-destruction effect as well as its recycling effect. Destiny can be extremely important because Gwen does not apply her light effect to either Medrod or Boars because they change to dark. I see some people, they like to run two, and Again, that goes back to the Boar's issue. I just don't understand why you run two Destiny over three. I think Destiny is the most important Noble Arms card. I want to make sure I have it either in my hand or in my graveyard as often as possible. I don't see the you can only have one on the field at a time as a hugely restrictive effect that says, oh, well, now I'm just going to get so cloggy I have to run only two. Nah, three. I run two Excalburns. As it's the card that completes the pseudo lock with Destiny. You attach Destiny, attach Calburn, and now your opponent can't can't destroy with one card. He needs to at least devote two re destruction resources that don't target. Very few decks in the game that can actually get over the lock without actually having to nuke Excalburn. And the problem with Excalburn, of course, is it's the only Noble Arms that seeds major play that doesn't have a recursion effect. While the inability to target the equipped monsters kind of the show-stopping effect of Excalibur, and its secondary effect of kind of ranking up or ranking down the archetype-specific XZ Kings can actually be very effective. I run two Galatin due to the attack bonus because all of the Noble Knight monsters are a little on the weak side, especially the XZs at 2,000 for the rank 4 and 2,200 for the rank 5. Thus, boosting attack is important for the whole killing monsters thing. You can protect yourself all you want, but if you can't actually make inroads against the opponent's life points, you're not really going to get anywhere. The loss of attack is rather irrelevant due to the effect of Excalburn. You can you know, rank up, rank down, or either your opponent's going to just lose, or they're going to remove your XZ equip, or your XZ, or whatever Noble Knight 
monster, whether it be Boars, Gwain, or Medrot that's actually equipped with it, before the loss becomes meaningful. The final decision with regard to the Noble Arms is between Caliburn and Arfredurder. I'm just going to call it Arf before I continue to embarrass myself with that pronunciation. I run Caliburn because, again, you want as much attack power as possible. The extra 500 helps. Also, the life point gain effect is a nice side benefit that can actually add up significantly over time. Note that the once turn effect only applies when Caliburn remains on the field. If it's removed from the field and then re-equipped through its own effect, or through an XZ monster's effect, you can use its effect again. Thus, it's not uncommon to gain 1,000 or 1,500 life points on a single turn from Caliburn. I don't run Arf because the ability to destroy set cards tends not to be useful for Noble Knights because Destiny and Excaliburn largely neutralize back row, and that 500 attack permanent loss is really significant because, as stated, Noble Knights don't have the highest attack powers. So, yeah, you're getting a quote-unquote free destruction, but then your monster is basically going to be run over next turn. I mean, you could argue, well, I'll attach it and then use its effect, then I'll XZ. And the problem, though, is Arf is kind of just a dead equip for the XZ. And you're almost better off, in some respects, running an MST over Arf. I mean, losing that attack power, it's just, it really hurts. Some might argue, well, I want to run Arf because I can equip it to an opponent's warrior monster, get my free pop, lower that monster's attack power so I can run it over easier. Problem with that strategy, it's not really efficient, and it's somewhat convoluted for my tastes. Finishing up on the Noble Knight-based spell cards, I run two copies of Last Chapter, one of the most annoying cards in the game for the opponent, as it's an incredible comeback card allowing a Noble Knight player to special summon a Medrot, recycle a Noble Arms card, and then go right into another King XZ. If you've been on the receiving end of a last chapter, you know how annoying this card can be. I don't run three because it's not good early game, so it can kind of get a little cloggy. But you tend to draw it with decent probability after you start clearing out your deck using Boar's Effect. Rounding out the spells, I play the general staples, one Regeki, one Book of Moon, one Soul Charge, and two Dark Holes. Overall, I don't understand the lack of running Dark Hole in most decks, but especially this deck. I mean, Dark Hole is slow, oh no, you have to activate it on your turn, but targetless, effect, targetless field clearance? Yeah, that's always good. With the effect of Destiny and, to some lesser extent, Gwen, Dark Hole and for Noble Knights is pretty much a Regeki. My trap selection is kind of sparse. The quasi staples, one Torrential. My opinion, this really should be in every deck that's not FTK based or OTK based. One Bottomless and, I guess, viewer's choice, one Ring of Destruction or one Compulse. I'm more of a fan of Compulse than I think a lot of other people are out there, but. The whole point between Ring or Compulse is just get rid of a monster so you open the way for your XZ King to slam in for 3,000 plus damage. Finally, because protecting the lock is so important, I use three Solemn Scoldings due to its negation versatility and how easy it is to activate in this deck build. The life point cost is somewhat irrelevant because of its overall importance, and Calburn's effect will help you out a lot. One thing to note when running Scoldings is remember not to set two at the same time, otherwise you lose the ability to activate either. So some may be surprised not to see Kaiser Coliseum. In my opinion, Kaiser Coliseum is generally a bad card, even in this deck. I think it hurts one of the chief advantages of the recycling capacity of Noble Arms. It's incredibly no annoying aspect of Noble Arms when, oh, I just wiped out one of your Noble Knights. Oh, I forgot about that other Noble Knight sitting there, and now everything but Excaliburn is going to come back and attach to him. If you're running Kaiser Coliseum, you kind of... you Really, the purpose of it is just to have the one monster. I have this one big XZ with the lock, and now I'm just going to limit your ability to use monster effects and XZs of your own to get rid of him. Well, the problem is you lose that advantage, and if he gets rid of him, wow, you just lost your entire board. Also, Coliseum doesn't really advance the win condition, because if you're... No Noble Knights really have piercing, so if you're playing that my one monster versus your one monster game, well, once you run out of ammunition for your rank 5 XZ, you really basically just have to, oh, I hit your monster, 
Oh, you put another one defense mode. Oh, I killed him, but I'm not making any headway. And while all the while, you're slowly building up resources for that play where you're going to wipe me out. Because the problem is noble knights really can't swarm effectively. So any attempts to play off of Colosseum and say, okay, I'm going to wait three turns. Oh, now i got a bunch of monsters in my hand. I'm going to summon three this turn. So now I have four monsters. I'm going to run you over before you can take advantage of that. It's not really viable for noble knights. Basically, overall, in my opinion, running Colosseum and Noble Knight deck is basically running some number of generic worthless cards for how many of our copies of Colosseum you run. Overall, I don't run Swords of Dawn in this deck because last chapter does what Swords of Dawn does, only better. And I don't run Hidden Armory in this deck because Hidden Armory is more designed to speed the acquisition of a specific equipped card where Noble Knights really just want any Noble Arms equipped. They don't care which one it is. And losing that normal summons from Hidden Armory, that's really hard for Noble Knights. They need their normal summons. Finally, for my extra deck, I run one copy of number 61, Volcasaurus. Good for late game burn damage to try to close up the game and monster destruction. Two copies of Sacred Noble Knight. It's the better of the two archetype specifics because it's got the 200 additional attack and it can destroy a monster either face up or face down with its XZ effect. I run three copies of Arturgus, King of the Noble Knights. The reason I run three copies of Arturgus is he's only rank four, so you can summon him with Gawain or Boar. Sacred Noble Knight, you can only go the Boar's Medrot, both equipped route. I run the rank four staples, you know, one copy of Exiton, one copy of number 101, one copy of Castell, one copy of Dark Rebellion XZ Dragon, and then you just the general warrior type XZs. I run one cosmic hero, King Arthur. You get attack power and stall. One copy of Blade Armor Ninja, it's a 2200 double attacker. One copy of Heroic Champion Excalibur, pure attack power without the need to target like Rebellion Dragon. One copy of Gaga Ga, Ga Cowboy for obvious burn damage game ending. And one copy Anti Luminescent Knight. With regards to a side deck, I'll leave that to you, the viewer, for the side deck is typically a reflection of the environment in which you play. It's not something set in stone. So, that is my Noble Knight deck. As one can see, the chief strategy of this deck is to access Medrot and Boars as soon as possible with multiple means to search these cards out if they're not drawn to the ha into the hand. Overall, supported by the Scoldings, this deck can effectively battle with the top decks, but it does have some concerns against decks like Necroz and Cleport only because of their you know, significantly power overpowered boss monsters like Trishula and Towers. Well, that about does it. Thank you for your attention and your time. I'm out.